Good evening. <laughs> Call to order this Coon Rapids City Council meeting for Tuesday, January 16th, 2018. If you could please rise and join us for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please call the roll. Councilmember Kraskoviak. Here. Councilmember Kicker. Here. Councilmember Demmer. Here. Councilmember Geisler. Here. Councilmember Johnson. Here. Councilmember Wells. Here. Mayor Cook. Here. Thank you. First item on our agenda this evening is to adopt this evening's agenda. And we're going to need to add in the minutes from the previous meeting under approval of the minutes. Mr. Mayor, I have a motion Kaiser. to adopt the agenda with the aforementioned addition of adoption of the minutes of January 2nd. Second. Motion by Geisler, second by Kicker. Discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? And the, those are, those, <laughs> it's passed. <laughs> <laughs> all right, you got to retrain me every meeting. I don't understand it. All right, first item on our agenda this evening then are proclamations and presentations. I'll bet we're going to get Fire Chief Piper up here. Not to be confused with Fire Marshal Bill. <laughs> Chief Piper. Thank you, Mayor. Mayor, Council, City Staff, citizens of Coon Rapids. As Fire Chief, I'd like to take the opportunity this evening to introduce you to our newest career firefighter. The Fire Department takes great pride in the service we provide to the citizens of Coon Rapids. With that, our mission statement states, the mission of Coon Rapids Fire Department is to provide efficient services designed to protect lives and property from the adverse effects of fires, medical emergencies, or exposure to dangerous conditions. We pursue this mission with determination and resolve, with emphasis on dedication, compassion, and constant improvement. To accomplish this mission, we need trained, dedicated, and compassionate personnel. With that, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce you to Tony Nelson. Tony is a lifelong resident of Coon Rapids and graduated from Coon Rapids High School in 2006. He attended Anoka Technical College for welding and medical, metal fabrication and worked in that field for the last 10 years. His firefighting education includes Firefighter 1, Firefighter 2, Emergency Medical Technician, and Hazardous Materials Technician. Tony has been a paid on call firefighter in Coon Rapids since 2012. Tony, you have been chosen and trained to be a firefighter for this organization. In addition to responding to emergencies, your duties are many. As a firefighter, you are responsible to maintain your knowledge, skills, and physical abilities. You are also responsible to provide quality service to our customers. It will be your duty to respond whenever called. Your chiefs, your crew, and the community rely on your abilities and professionalism in the performance of your role as firefighter. I know you, you will provide many years of excellent service to our city, the community you have always called home. With that said, we will now have the formal pinning of Tony's badge number 77, followed by him swearing an oath of office performed by, Mary, by Mayor Jerry Cook. So I would like to introduce you to Tony's mother, Kathy, as the person he selected to pin on his badge. thinking it was so nice of her to put her glasses on so she didn't poke you. <laughs> <laughs> and I almost forgot to come down. Excellent. So will you hold the mic with your left hand? All right. And hold up your right hand. I, Anthony Nelson, do solemnly swear. I, Anthony Nelson, do solemnly swear. That I will support the policies and procedures of the Coon Rapids Fire Department. That I will support the policies and procedures of the Coon Rapids Fire Department. I will faithfully, honorably, and to the best of my ability, I will faithfully, honorably, and to the best of my ability, protect the safety and lives of my fellow firefighters, protect the safety and lives of my fellow firefighters, and citizens whose care has been entrusted to me, 
who, and citizens whose care has been entrusted to me. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations. Thank you, sir. Chief Gilsrud, you're not going to hang around. Uh, you're going to. <laughs> All right. Next on our agenda this evening. Um, oh, did we already, oh no! Now is the approval of the minutes of the previous meeting. Uh, we had so much discussion about the minutes. I was thinking we already approved them. All right. So approval of the minutes of the previous meeting. Mr. Mayor. Uh, Councilmember Guys. I'll we'll make a motion to approve the minutes of January second, twenty eighteen. Second. Motion by Geisler, second by Demmer. Uh, discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain. That motion carries, one abstention, Council Member Johnson. Um, we have three items on our consent agenda this evening. The first one is to adopt resolution 18-24, approving a wellhead protection implementation joint powers agreement so this will be to consider entering into a joint powers agreement administered by Anoka County to jointly implement the wellhead protection plans of member cities. Um, and as our staff currently participates in the group, it would be beneficial to memorialize Coon Rapids' membership. The first addendum permits any Anoka County municipality to join the wellhead group by simply a certified resolution of their city council and the attached documents 2010 JPA and addendum were drafted by Assistant County Attorney Nancy Norman and received, and I'm sorry, and reviewed by the City Attorney. So our first thing will be to adopt resolution number 18-24, approving the Wellhead Protection Implementation Joint Powers Agreement with Anoka County and over Anoka, Blaine, Centerville, Circle Pines, Fridley and Lexington, Lionel Lake, St. Francis, and Spring Lake Park. And there is no budget impact for this. There, is no, there are no associated costs for the city to join the group. Um, next one on our consent agenda is to authorize execution of amended joint powers agreement for the street materials uh, contract. In 2004, the cities of Coon Rapids, Andover, Brooklyn Center, Columbia Heights, and Fridley joined together to solicit bids for street maintenance services. The joint powers agreement has since been amended to include Ham Lake, East Bethel, Anoka, Matamidi, Circle Pines, and Moundsview. Also, the, uh, well, let's we skip that line. Uh, the city of Arden Hills and the city of St. Francis expressed interest in joining the group to participate in 2018 activities. On December 11, 2017, Arden Hills adopted a resolution authorizing the execution of a joint powers agreement and participation in our program. St. Francis adopted a similar resolution on December 14, 2017. The Ninth Amendment need only be executed by the cities of Coon Rapids, Arden Hills, and St. Francis. Um, so if we approve the joint powers agreement amendment, staff will forward an executed copy to all participating cities. So with this, we will be authorizing execution of the Ninth Amendment to the joint powers agreement, adding Arden Hills and St. Francis to the North Metro Regional Street Maintenance Consortium. And then the last item on our consent agenda is to approve the service agreement with Alexandra House Alexandra House is a nonprofit corporation that is Anoka County's only women's shelter. It provides a 24-hour shelter, support services, advocacy, educational opportunities to women and their children in the city and Anoka County. Alexandra House also works with the police department and the city attorney's office with domestic violence cases. Alexandra House has made a request for financial assistance for the services it provides to the city. The council did appropriate $12,500 to the Alexander House in the 2018 budget for these services. This service agreement reduces the party's wishes to writing. The agreement is for one year and it can be terminated by either party with 30 days notice. 
Should this contract be terminated early, the funds paid shall be returned by Alexandra House in proportion to the number of months the contract was not fulfilled. Should we call that the Council Member Johnson? <laughs> Clause. <laughs> Clause, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so this will approve the city to enter into a service agreement with Alexandra House to provide shelter, support services, and advocacy to women and their children in the city. And that is the end of our consent agenda. Questions? Motions? Move to Council. accept the consent agenda. Second. Motion by Demmer, <laughs> second by Kicker to approve the consent agenda. Is there any discussion? Mayor? Council Member Griscovia. Regarding the Wellhead Protection Implementation Joint Powers, I actually thought we were part of this Wellhead Protection Group already. It makes sense, in my opinion, that all the counties, the cities in Anoka County are part of this. I was just wondering if the staff has the main reason why we haven't opted to join this group up until now, when it was formed eight years ago. Mr. Stemmel? Mayor and Council, as I understand it, the um, we were a, sort of an original member of the group when the group's uh, focus was really on sharing resources information around um, uh, the plans, making sure that cities had shared that information. That it, then later at some time, the focus of the group had shifted a little bit more into implementation and sort of a countywide effort. And for whatever reason, the city decided at the time that you know they weren't willing to go that extra step or didn't maybe agree with that focus or whatever it was. Uh, but that since then, the, sh the shift has focused more back to a collaboration, information, resource sharing, meeting to discuss common issues, that sort of thing. We participated in it as sort of the non-formal member. Um, and so at this time, we just thought it would make sense to memorialize that membership. So I don't have all the detail. I know there's a representative here that could probably speak to that more so than I, if, uh, if council wanted to hear that. But I think that was the short version. I think that covers it for me. Oh, good. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, any other discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? And the consent agenda is adopted. Not that I wouldn't have loved to sit through a wellhead <laughs> protection um, presentation yeah. or dissertation or whatever. Yeah, sure. Thanks for helping me with my words today. <laughs> um, item five is to uh, hold a public hearing and an introduction of ordinance for the Pleasure Creek District Dissolution. Um, Ms. Legg, do you want to introduce this or do you, or, or do you want to talk about it or do you want me to read what the discussion is here? Uh, Mayor and Council, basically what we're doing is we are starting again another process to dissolve one of the, there were two special uh, storm drainage districts. <clears throat> we haven't issued bonds or done anything with this district for a long time. Um, essentially, it's just been open, but the problem with having them open is if a property crosses into it, I mean, if one proper property is in it and another one's not and you want to combine, then all of a sudden it becomes an issue because they're in different taxing districts. So we're, we need a public hearing, and then we would have the first reading of the ordinance and then uh, the second to dissolve it. And basically what it will take is the county will have to take out the special um, code on the system, but then it will be done. Okay. Does anybody have any questions about this before we open it up for the public hearing? All right, in that case, then we will open the public hearing in the matter of the uh, Pleasure Creek District Dissolution. Anybody here to speak at the public hearing for the Pleasure Creek Drainage District Dissolution? Love tying all those iterations together. All right, nobody here for the Pleasure Creek District Dissolution. We'll close the public hearing and we will consider this introduced and we will be looking at it again at the next council meeting then is that right february all right <coughs> item six is just an introduction consider an ordinance introduction to allow veterinary clinics as a permitted use in the regional shopping district sambatic incorporated uh, Mr. Harlicker's not here. Mr. Fernelius, anything you want to talk about on this? Sure. I, I can add a few comments, uh, Mr. Mayor and Council. So this is a, an ordinance introduction related to allowing uh, veterinary clinics as a permitted use in the regional shopping district. Currently, um, those kinds of uses are only allowed in the general um, community commercial and office districts. Um, 
So one of the, I guess the, the main point is that uh, the applicant believes that a veterinary uh, clinic is a very similar use to pet stores and grooming shops, both of which are uses that um, are allowed in the, in the regional shopping district. We do have one existing business uh, that operates um, uh, pet services, if you will, veterinary services. So we believe that the, that the code amendment is appropriate uh, in this particular request. It's consistent with the comp plan um, uh, and some of the other um, issues that we would be concerned about as a, as a city. I can tell you that at the Planning Commission meeting there was some discussion, a very brief discussion, um, about you know what exactly encompasses a veterinary clinic uh, and there was also some discussion about uh, kennels um, but essentially I, th I think the Planning Commission was satisfied that that this use with the um, with the language that is proposed is not detrimental to other uses within within that district so we would be happy or I would be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Okay. Um, Kicker. So um, with the the veterinarian clinics do they offer emergency services um i think in general they do yes uh, i think that the biggest issue concerns um o overnight care and boarding uh, of of uh, animals and in this case that would not be permitted they could not have a a, a run uh as part of this particular proposal or this ordinance amendment so th they wouldn't be able to house any any animals overnight, either. Correct. Is what you're saying. Correct. Okay. That's correct. And it, do do, I, do pet hospitals typically do that for clinics? Because I I think hospitals and clinics are are both kind right. of under this. Right. I mean, I, I think uh, there I think there is a distinction between this between a, a, a veterinary service and a pet hospital. I think there's more. Um, intensive care that's provided by a pet hospital versus a veterinary clinic. I thought in the proposed ordinance, though, that it, it had listed both. Is that? Yeah. Councilmember Wells. Yeah, I guess so my question was on the overnight stay because a previous dog I did take to the Banfield uh, Pet Hospital in PetSmart, and they kept uh, her overnight when she needed specific care that they had to monitor her. So they're currently doing that. Okay. And I don't really see if you had a veterinary clinic, why that would be a problem. It's a lot different than a, a pet run, an outside mm -hmm. or anything. I mean, uh, a sick dog overnight, I don't know who that bothers. I mean, if you're gonna, and I don't see how, if you can allow PetSmart to do it, how you could tell another vet, veterinary clinic that they couldn't. Mr. Mayor, I think you know the the point um, is that we're trying to um, the primary concern really relates to the noise issue, and so that's why this particular uh, amendment would eliminate the kennel the kennel provision uh, as part of the the code language. So, provided no animal is kept over well overnight or outside, and no noise is audible. Yeah, I mean, for me, for me, the big thing is as long as they're not kept outside. And there's no noise that's audible to the businesses around it. Yeah, I don't know. But but this is this is still gonna limit it, so they can't be overnight though, right? Correct. Well, I guess I don't understand why we would do that. If the you know, the, the dog I had happened to be very, very sick, and I guarantee you when it was kept overnight it was because it was drugged up and just had surgery mm -hmm. and you know, it wasn't creating any noise. But again, if you've already got a business in this center that can do that I mean, I don't think anybody's going there to tell them that they can no longer provide the service that they've been providing since they've been there. I don't know why we put it in an ordinance for a veterinary clinic. Have we had any complaints of the ones that are already being kept overnight? Or? Mr. Mayor, not that I'm aware of. Yeah, I don't think so. I, I mean, I guess I was, my concern with the emergency services was just that, you know, you're you're in a regional shopping area, and if you have somebody that's, got an emergency with their pet and they're you know maybe driving a little fast going through a very busy you know those roads aren't necessarily designed for speed you know that was the only concern I had because it, it it was comparing it to uh, pet ser you know uh, pet services in the pet smart but mm -hmm. that was more I, I thought that was more vaccination type things which you know I'm, I imagine you schedule a visit and, and show up you're not really 
um, it's not any an emergency situation. That was that was my only concern about that. If they offered that kind of service, it you know is is a regional shopping district, you know, the ideal spot for that. I'm wondering if some clarification could be made so that um, in the ordinance, because I think we're all looking at this part where it's a block and it says veterinary clinic, animal hospital, it's got kennel crossed out. Right. Um, and then it says no outdoor runs and no noise is audible outside the building or lease space, which I think everybody here sounds like they agree with that concept. But some clarification that, um, you know, it's almost like no... Um, uh, outdoor kennels uh, or uh, kenneling that's unrelated to, you know, animal care or something like that. You know, so that if there were a situation where a dog had to stay for observation overnight or a cat had to stay overnight because of some procedure, that, that they'd be allowed to do that and that was clear. I don't know if that would require too much of an amendment to what's well, being introduced. It might be a little bit of a misunderstanding because I'm not sure if you can, I can discuss or this department that I think 24-hour care was anticipated. I think we wanted to make sure that it didn't affect by limiting outside runs, not having those, making sure the noise couldn't be heard outside the building, that that would alleviate then those concerns about having animals there overnight. Sure. So and if so there were some clarification that we could have for the next meeting, I, just, I think we'll check into that. We're all on the same page on that, so. Okay. Mr. Mayor, to, to me, you know, kenneling is for well dogs that I'm just going to put them in boarding. Boarding, yeah, yeah. yeah. and versus medical care, you know. <clears throat> and I, if a pet store is there, I'm I'm assuming those pets stay there overnight at the pet store, you know. So it's not like there's something different. Yeah, that's true. That's a good point. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Councilmember Demmer? Um, yeah, I guess I hadn't necessarily thought of the someone coming screaming around the corner. Um, would it be possible just to look at where our animal hospitals currently are and, and see if they're in areas that would be similar traffic patterns and speeds and I don't know, just maybe check to see if there's a higher than normal number of accidents near animal hospitals. I, I, that might be kind of a big ask for, for the next week, but I think it is a reasonable concern that you don't want to go into a really busy shopping center with high-speed traffic. Uh, uh, the overnight thing doesn't bother me because the other stores are closed anyway. <laughs> yep. Yeah. And the only other question I had is, did you want to limit it to small animals? So. <laughs> See a horse trailer pulling horse, up outside. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'm I'm not terribly concerned about the about the traffic. I think that's going to be an issue anywhere. There, if you have somebody that's driving recklessly because they have a injured animal, I think that's going to be a hazard any on any street they're on. Yeah. I mean, we got a hospital in town. You would you would think people would drive faster with somebody really ill than just a dog. Hopefully but. they call the ambulance. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Councilmember Demmer reminds me all the time I'm really old and I don't remember ever <laughs> writing an accident report or hearing of an accident report where someone was rushing an animal. See, that's to just, a that's just good to know. That makes, <laughs> <laughs> that makes it a lot easier to approve. <laughs> all right. Um, so we'll just consider this introduced then. Just check all these others off. All right, so we are on item seven, and this is also an introduction only. Consider introduction of an ordinance amending Chapter 10-200 Right of Way Management. And I just highlighted Tim Himmer. I figured he would present this, so but he's not here tonight. Um, so I'll just read the. Uh, this is regarding um, the cell, the cell towers. So small cells, like full-size cell towers, provide access points by which groups of individuals can browse the internet, send and receive text messages, and make phone calls. However, unlike cellular towers, small cells take up significantly less space. In the 2017 legislative session, the legislature amended the Minnesota's, 
or amended Minnesota's right of way user statutes to specifically address small wireless facilities and the support structures on which those facilities may attach. The city attorney and several staff have consulted with the League of Minnesota Cities and other metro cities regarding this new technology. This proposed ordinance will address how to appropriately handle requests from private telecommunications companies to install, to install small cell cellular and support antennas on existing facilities within the public right of way, such as streetlights, traffic signals, signs, etc. While reviewing the right of way management code, several items were discovered to be outdated, so additional updates were deemed necessary and are included in the attached draft ordinance. Generally, the proposed revisions include the addition of language related to small cell technology, updates to statute references, consolidation of specific permits, and fees to better reflect how right of way management is being administered, and clarification of restoration requirements. Is there anything from staff that you'd like to cover on this, or should we just consider it introduced? I think that was a good summary by Mr. Yeah. Rimmer. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well then we will consider um, consider this ordinance amending chapter 10-200 right-of-way management introduced, which brings us to item eight. Consider resolution 18-27, amending the facility construction fund budget and uh, would like to cover this one, Mr. Stemmel. Okay. Mayor Council, yeah, we can we can tag team this one. Okay. Um, what this is proposing to do is utilize some dollars within the facilities construction fund um, to help us plan around some of our um, our buildings, including city hall, public works, and our fire stations. Essentially, what we'd like to do is create a capital improvement plan for these buildings. We know there are a number of significant capital projects that are coming up most notably things like replacement of roofs, some windows, HVAC equipment, and so forth. Um, that will be some pretty big ticket items that we feel like it's important for us to get a head start on planning, um, both from the standpoint of how those things get funded and then what the priorities are. What this uh, process would also allow us to do is to look at some other interior improvements um, as City Hall approaches, you know, about 25 years old, we're seeing some of our furniture and equipment just deteriorates, and again, we want to plan that over, over a course of number of years. And so what we've done is sent out an RFP uh, to some architectural firms to help us plan for that, and what this would do is utilize some of our dollars in facilities construction fund for that purpose. Uh, right now we're looking at three firms that have a range of cost between fifteen dollars and $30,000, and we're kind of down to the final steps now. On and Considering that, obviously, we would need council approval before we'd uh, move forward with that. <clears throat> Council, any questions? Mayor. Council Member Groviak. This is going to be a study that kind of gives us a map of where our infrastructure needs work going forward. As part of the study, are they going to develop an estimate of some of the costs, or is, or is that part of it? That's what I, my question would be. Council Member Groviak, Mayor and Council, yes, uh, that would be a, it's a very big component for us mm -hmm. that they estimate some of those costs and kind of a phasing approach to that. Um, because we know things like the roof it, for city halls can be very expensive. We need to get kind of an order of magnitude for that. Um, the windows that were put into city hall aren't the highest quality, and we feel like there's going to come a point where those might need to be replaced. And so, to give us an estimate for that, such that when we come to budgeting time, we can prioritize those over the next again five to ten years, whatever that time frame is, and have plug numbers for that, and then have a better understanding of how we're going to budget around that and make it happen. Got it. Thank you. That whatever firm that gets this, will they also have expertise in guiding us towards rebates and things when there's, uh, when, when Excel or somebody, for lack of a different word, um, is offering rebates if you replace windows or lighting or something, will they be experts in that as well or will we be on our own? <laughs> uh, Mayor and Council, I think yes, they'll be able to help us with that. Um, a lot of what they'll do is go through our HVAC um, do kind of suggestions around lighting, windows, or whatever it might be. And since this is sort of their daily work, they certainly are aware of uh, those programs. And many of the firms we're working with uh, specialize in government buildings and city halls and fire station and things like that. And so they would have a good sense of how um, you know a city hall or a government might be able to take advantage of those things. Okay, thank you. Your Honor. 
Councilmember Johnson? I'd move approval of the recommendation uh, for a $35,000 investment in the facilities construction uh, fund for the purpose of doing the study. Second. Motion by Johnson, second by Wells. Um, so that would be adopting resolution number 18-27, uh, number amending the 2018 facilities construction fund an amount of $35,000. Is that kind of how the but is that the motion? Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. Discussion? Mr. Mayor. Council Member Geisler. Uh, to me, it's the right thing to do. It's We have to understand what our risks are and what those needs are going to be so we can be fiscally responsible as we plan what our, is the best timing and making sure that we don't have any emergencies of something failing when we haven't even started to think about it. So. Any other discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? And that motion carries. And now we're looking at resolution 18-26, amending the public communication fund budget uh, for replacing the standard HD lenses for the large high definition HD, HD truck this year. Um, are we going to get to hear from Mr. Strauss this evening? He's all Mayor dressed Council up. Would invite He's all dressed yes, up. Yeah, <laughs> we have to get him on camera for that. <laughs> Welcome, Eric Strauss from CTN Studios. Welcome. Thank, thank you, Mr. Mayor and, and Council. Um, it probably seems a little odd that I'm coming, requesting funds right after our budget, um, but. Uh, uh, it's, I guess, a good thing. Um, we've had a lot of projects on our on our paid production side of things, uh, and as we mentioned here in the in the in the uh, uh, discussion, uh, that we were originally planning on purchasing standard uh, HD lenses. Uh, the current ones are in pretty rough shape, uh, but we've had several projects uh, that we've passed on or did not get because we don't have the higher zoom ratio lenses that uh, they use a lot of times for sports and concerts. So what, what we're looking for uh, tonight, um, well, we have the Super Bowl. We have two projects that came up on the Super Bowl that we've shared. Um, one was the Polaris lead jump, and the second was the Club Pneumatic. And I think probably you've seen the information on the Club Pneumatic event. Um, uh, that they moved that inside to Mystic Lake, and there's a lot of discussion on why that is. Some people think it was low ticket sales, others construction issues with the new facility. Um, but um, that was one of the reasons that we brought this forward tonight was because we needed the lenses for those projects. Uh, the Club Pneumatic event, uh, when they moved it inside, they're no longer going to use uh, or need outside production, so our client uh, is no longer handling everything. Uh, so that project has gone away, which when we drafted this, this we just found out Friday late afternoon. But uh, we decided to still proceed with this because if we can't purchase the, one, of the, the one box style lens, uh, we would use that uh, for the other project, the sled project, and then we wouldn't have to rent. Plus we could use that lens for a lot of our other productions like Saints Baseball and um, offer that to other clients and hopefully bring in some new additional clients. Um, the second uh, project that we have outside of the Super Bowl, uh, we're still waiting to hear. And so I didn't, obviously, that requires some other lenses, uh, two different lenses that we don't have that we'd be looking to purchase uh, also used. And uh, those would be a total of $68,000 for the two of them. I expect to know in the next couple of weeks, probably by next Tuesday, um, because it's already in mid-February, and so we need to get the order in, and obviously it'd be a time crunch. That, even if approved tonight, um, we would not make the purchase of those additional lenses unless that project comes through. So that way the money that would come in for that would more than pay for the lens, actually would pay for all the lenses. <laughs> um, so we're excited about that project, but um, I don't have any information on that yet. Uh, as to whether that um, may go forward. So, um, so what, ideally what we're requesting is 65,000 for the box lens, uh, used box lens and tripod and accessories, and then an additional $68,000 that would be contingent on that additional project. Um, and I've worked with 
uh, sharing a mat. We've looked at our budget. Um, we do have the money available, but obviously, you know, this is a big change. Uh, so um, putting that request forward to council. Well, Mr. Stemwell first and then. Amir Council, I just want to reiterate that with um, both of these purchases, well, uh, obviously would suit the needs of these more immediate projects. I think it's important to reiterate that they would be used sort of on multiple fronts moving forward, both with current clients, as Eric mentioned, with the Saints, but also there have been a number of times that uh, Eric hasn't even applied for a project or has been overlooked because of the fact that we don't have these, or when we do get them, we're forced to rent them, and they're fairly expensive, something like $1,000 a day to do that. And as CTN has uh, received more and more production services, we've gotten more into that field. Um, this has been one area from equipment standpoint that's held them back a little bit um, from getting some of the additional projects. So, um, you know, my comfort level in, in purchasing these would be that not only would they sort of address these immediate projects, but that also moving forward, open up opportunities and uh, be useful in our current, with our current clients. Excellent. Councilor Demer. So if I'm, I'm understanding it right, the, the plan was to ask for these in the 2019 budget, but um, the expectation here is by getting them sooner, there'll be more revenue in the 2019 budget instead. So cool. it's kind of an investment for the 2019 budget. You're, yeah. you're not going to come back and ask for bigger ones in 2019. <laughs> nice spin. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great point, Council Member Denver. I, I don't like to make promises. Like <laughs> um, especially when I'm on the record. Uh, but, uh, um, that would be the plan. Actually, the, the one box lens, we were looking at putting it into the 2018 budget, um, but because we were replacing out the other lenses, we thought, let's hold off, try to make it just another year, um, and hopefully not have all these big projects um, come to us. But uh, and I think with the reputation from the projects that we've been doing, we are getting more and more requests. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I guess, if I did have to come, that, that would be a good thing because that means we're making a lot more money and need um, additional tools. But hopefully not. This should uh, take care of our needs, especially if, if that other project comes through and we'd have those other two uh, additional lenses, I think we'd be pretty set. Council? Council Member Yes, Mayor. Yeah. Um, a question in the 2018 budget, I know we approved lenses. Correct. Five of them, yes. right? All right. So these are in addition to those. Okay, I thought I understood that correctly. Is there a? Re is there a? I am not a lens expert, but <laughs> we're purchasing the higher quality ones, and this and these two additional ones are going to be higher quality. Could you use the higher quality lens in, in the place. case of those other five? You see uh, what I'm saying? Yes, uh, Council Member Griskoviak and uh, fellow council. Um, We've looked at that a little bit. Um, if we purchased, uh, basically that truck has five cameras in it. And so we're looking at five lenses that would be the standard that we take out and do any community concert or community event uh, and some of the other small projects. The big box lens is, uh, as I mentioned in the memo, it's a lot heavier and it's, it takes a little longer to set up. So we wouldn't want to set those up in some situations. We couldn't put them in, let's just say, the high school bleachers. Okay. It's too big of a tripod. To, and so we've looked at, like, we're, our plan right now is probably to cut back to four of the other lenses and try to rotate, um, maybe hold on to one of the other lenses, the best one that we need to replace, uh, and try to make do with that. But the lenses are different scenarios in different situations. Uh, the box lens, like I mentioned, we couldn't ever put in the bleachers. There's a lot of places we can't use that lens because it's it's like twice the size. It's about 50 pounds as opposed to about 15 of the standard lens. Um, and so it's meant to zoom in really close. That's the difference there. All the lenses are really high quality, high definition lenses, but the bigger box and the bigger ones, it's all about zooming in. Um, like we couldn't use it in here because we're too close. Um, otherwise we just see your eyeball and <laughs> um, because we'd be too close. So. Um, but yeah, we, we've been looking at that, like could we cut one out? Um, that was kind of what we're looking at right now. I see. Okay, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. So if I understand it right, these are for use in kind of higher profile outdoor events, like for example, the Red Bull crushed ice event. When you're way off at a distance, you can zoom in on a, on a 
contestant or something like that and have a good clear picture of it. Uh, yes, Council Member Johnson, that is correct. Um, it is more of the, it's the venue that really right. decides like this actually could be used at Crick um, because it's a concrete surface because when you're zoomed in that far, um, the slightest movement and you're moving three yep. feet, four feet. Um, so uh, it does, it is venue dependent, but like high school football, we could use it in the end zone mm -hmm. um, where it's nice and stable and we could shoot and get the quarterback's um, yep. face at the other end at the 20 as they're coming down the field, so. Okay. Oh, well, for sure then. <laughs> <laughs> All right, any other? Questions of Mr. Strauss or motions or anything? Councilmember Demmer? Uh, move resolution 18-26, uh, amending the 2018 Public Communications Fund capital budget for these lenses. Second. Motion by Demmer, second by Kicker. Discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? And that motion carries. Thank you. Thanks. And thanks for dressing so nice for us this evening. <laughs> for you guys. <laughs> um, 10. Item 10 was to consider a purchase of a vac door truck for sanitary sewer. And we have the funds to replace units. Uh, it's funds to replace units S207 and unit 78, both 2007 Sterling vac door trucks are included in the sanitary and, sanitary and storm sewer funds in the amounts of $512,103 and $494,975 respectively. The 2018 budget includes trade-in values estimated at $90,000 each. At this time, the fleet maintenance supervisor is recommending the purchase of a replacement unit for the sewer operation. Um, Mr. Stemmel or Ms. Legg, do you wanna? I'll go on this one, uh, Mayor and Council. Um, so we do have funds budgeted. However, at this time, we're recommending only one of them be purchased. We're going to do a little bit more work on the other one. The other one doesn't have as many repair costs. Um, these vehicles, even though they're low miles, they do get used a lot. But this vehicle that we are suggesting replacement of um, is in the sewer fund. The other one is the storm drainage fund. We are going to be more aggressive in terms of cleaning the storm drainage system in the future, so we expect it to get more wear than it had in the past, but we're, we're still looking at that one. So we just wanted to alert you that this one here we're recommending now, there may be another one coming forth in the future. So this one, there's been probably $100,000 of expenditures on over its lifetime, whereas the other one is a lot less. And then the one coming out of the sewer fund, is greater than the amount originally budgeted by $22,861 due to the addition of the heater for the water tank. This avoids water freezing during the winter, which has been an issue that needed to be dealt with in the past. That seems like a really good idea, especially coming off of this 20 below stretch we've had. Right. <laughs> in the past, they, could sh they would have to shuffle the trucks back and forth to keep them heated. Yeah. So this will eliminate some of that um, kind of movement or whatever. Sure, that makes sense. <laughs> Council Member Wells, you got a motion or something, or what? <laughs> Although I do think with a half million dollar, dollar truck, the public works should be present to win. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'll move the purchase of a 2018 Vector truck from McQueen Equipment uh, under state contract for five hundred two thousand three hundred thirteen dollars. Second. Motion by Wells, second by Geisler. Is there a discussion? Mayor. Council Member Griscoviak. I actually toured the Public Works building about a year ago, and they saw this coming I'm way ahead of time. So it is budgeted. I'm glad to see that we might be able to get some life out of the other unit. I think that's great. Uh, but we saw this coming. I know we're prepared, and I guess we need to go for it. Do it. Okay. Mr. Brody, did you want the rest of that motion read, or are we okay with just what we got? I think we're okay. All right. Any other discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? And that motion carries. If you have kids at home that like trucks, you can search on Vector Truck. They're pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> I did that. Or, or make sure you come out for the Public Works open house in, was that May? Is that when we have yes. that? Because that's just cool. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
Um, item 11 is to consider an agreement with Zao 998 LLC. Apparently they don't have to market to the general public. Uh, for public improvements to River Rapid Drive and 124th Avenue. Um, so I keep looking at that empty chair over there. Um, I can add if necessary. Yeah. Mayor and Council members, this is in relationship to the uh, that uh, development outside of Home Depot, and so it's uh, they're doing to do most of the, the developer is doing most of the work in that area. We do have this agreement for some cost sharing in relationship to the work that's being done in the right of way. Um, so we've put together the agreement for the council's approval, and and like I said, I think we're capped at ten thousand dollars of our expenditure, and obviously we'll be overseeing that project as well. Council, any questions on this? Or? I actually have a question, Mr. Mayor. So, is we hired SRF Consultant to do a larger scale traffic study, and I'm sure River Rapids Drive and 124th is one of those areas that's we're studying because it's kind of a, a weird intersection. My question is: Has this design been communicated to SRF Consulting, so they're taking that into consideration? My concern would be that. We spend money on making some changes, and the SRF says, no, you should have gone that way instead of this way, and we would have to redo something. So. Mr. Stemmel? Go ahead. Mr. Phileas? Um, Again, Tim. Anybody? <laughs> Tim? <laughs> Mr. Anderson, you got it? <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Stemmel. Mayor Council, what I was going to uh, mention is that when the application for this improvement came through the development, there was some time spent on this particular area because there were so many sort of ways in and out and it was just a lot of conflict points so it needed to be addressed more immediately. Um, certainly as SRF is look, taking a, a wider picture view of the area, I guess there's potential they may say some small things but my guess is a lot of what they might say is related to how um, the road interacts with Main Street and so forth um, kind of outside the control of this particular improvement. Um, but I think for the more immediate need of this development that this will alleviate a lot of those conflict points um, That go through there and it was um, so the timing isn't maybe perfect from that standpoint But I on the other hand, I think these improvements were going to be warranted either way and um, Will be a, a pretty big benefit to the new development there. I I agree with that. I just wouldn't want these improvements in any way to limit our options that come from SRF and fixing and cleaning that up and making it easier to navigate. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Or did you still need more of an answer on that? No. All right, good. <laughs> on the record. <laughs> so we're with Demer. Is that, so, so it sounded like the action there was it would be good if you went back and, and talked to the other guys about this is something we're planning on doing. Don't, you know, just I know, make I can, them aware. Yeah, I can tell you that Mr. Zimmer and, and the city spent a lot of time in negotiation with the developer of this particular project about these access points. I assume with the bigger picture in mind of, you know, of that entire intersection, that entire area. So I presume that Mr. Himmer wouldn't want to proceed and limit us in any fashion with this particular agreement, that he assumes that it will be sort of in association or with that particular action. I can't speak on his behalf, but like I said, we, I know he and the rest of engineering and, and community development spent a lot of time on that particular on these particular details and um, with uh, the, the developer. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Any site plan has to meet all the engineering comments, and traffic is a big conversation. Um, I don't remember all of the details, but I know that that was part of the discussion when that site plan was approved. And so my belief is that this work will align to the engineering comments and what was designed with that site plan with that traffic in mind. So with that, I would make a motion to approve the agreement with Zao 998 LLC for public improvements to River Rapids Drive and 124th Avenue and authorize the mayor and city manager to execute the agreement. I'll second that. Motion by Geisler, second by Johnson. Discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? And that motion carries. And we are on item 12 to consider the 2017-2018 insurance 
renewals. Uh, Ms. Lake, you want to? Sure. Uh, Mayor and Council, um, what the, is, you have before you tonight is our essentially our 2018 uh, property and liability insurance package. So what we're recommending is what we've had in the past, a $50,000 deductible up to an aggregate of 200000 If we were to reach $200,000 in claims, then it reverts to like a $1,000 deductible instead of the $50,000 deductible. Um, it, we kind of compare, well, we compare two other size deductibles, what it would cost us, for example, to have a $1,000 deductible or a $25,000 deductible, and the, the cost just seems to outweigh the benefit. Of course, it is a little bit of a kind of a roll of the dice. Hopefully, we don't have big claims. In 2017, we did have two claims that exceeded um, 25000 which was unusual. But, um, but that's, like I say, that's unusual. So when we compare the cost, it just makes sense to stick with the $50,000 deductible. So what we're essentially doing is we're insuring, we're self-insuring for our vehicles, like our, um, the, the physical damage for the vehicles, other than the big vehicles like fire trucks or the big semi-type dump trucks we're insuring. Um, the other thing that we're recommending is that we maintain statutory limits. It is possible to buy an excess liability policy. So if there was like an interstate sort of claim or a, um, like a discrimination suit or something that wasn't covered by the statutory um, limits, that it could exceed that. We've not bought that excess liability coverage for many, many years. Um, it becomes questionable always, should we not do it again? But if you look at the cost, it was like 76000 or 78000 something similar or something like that to get that extra insurance. So um, this is what we have been doing for a number of years and we're recommending we do that one more year. Um, the other thing that we're recommending is a, the council's been pretty adamant that they want the sewer backup coverage. We did have two claims. Um, that was a good year in 2017. It, it amounted to only about $11,000. But where we will cover sewer backups um, claims, no matter whose fault it is. If we didn't have that coverage, we would only claim or cover the claims where the city was to be found negligent. And to have the city be negligent, we'd have to prove that we weren't maintaining the sewers and there was a reason why we should have known that it could have backed up. So those are essentially the three items. I did talk in there about our experience and, and some of the reasons why our um, premiums are going up or down or wherever they're going. I explained that in the body of the, the memo, but um, there's three recommended action items. Council Member Demmer. So that, that the last couple of years, there's sort of been the choice of which one we wanted to do, and, and um, I think everyone's agreed on the the, the no fault, so good to see that. Uh, I guess we could change our mind if we wanted to, but I see enough nodding to say we'll just move it this way. Um, I think the right way to move this is uh, move to purchase insurance through LMCIT with a $50,000 deductible up to an annual aggregate of $200,000. Uh, also move to maintain statutory legal limit of $1.5 million per occurrence and move to authorize resolution 18-25 purchasing sewer backup liability insurance. Second. Motion by Demmer, second by Kicker. Discussion? Mayor. Council Member Kraskoviak. If I could just get a clarification from Sharon on this, that no fault sewer backup coverage, we purchased that in 2017, correct? Yes. You mentioned that we paid two claims amounting 11,437. Did you mean that our insurance Paid two claims? Yes. Okay. All right. But we have a $50,000 deductible. That was my next question. <laughs> we, is the $50,000 deductible on that portion as well? Yes. It is. Mm -hmm. We've talked about this in the past. Um, it is because they still are investigating it and they're insuring at that. I mean, the cost for us to buy that, that $16,000 is incorporating the $50,000 deductible. Mm. If we had a lower deductible on just that option, the premium would be a lot higher. Has there ever been a case where the city has paid over $50,000 in sewer backup? Or even a homeowner, for that matter? 
Is that? Uh, that seems like I a, yeah. don't yeah. Well, that think hundred and eleventh when that sewer, that main broke and drove it into those basements of those several houses, those finished ones. That was during the period when we didn't have the 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 the, the, the insurance, the right? No fault. The no fault. Yeah, and I don't feel like that even exceeded. Hmm. Well, wait, did you say fifty thousand? Maybe in total what? that might have exceeded fifty, and all of those. Um, and I, I don't remember if that was treated as one claim or if they're all multiple claims. I, I just don't know. I could go back and look, but I can't think of any that come to mind that exceeded fifty thousand. Councilmember Gerskoviak, the the challenge is if we don't if we don't have the insurance, we have no mechanism to reimburse or to compensate people when that comes back up. When we when the sewer that we the sewer service that we sell them backs up into their basement, we have no mechanism to to cover any of their damages unless we buy this insurance. So even though we pay for the premium and then we and then we cover our own deductible, it's our only mechanism. Isn't that the, isn't that accurate? Mr. Stemwell? Mayor Council that That's correct. Unless we were proven to be negligent in some way, you know, there's an existing issue we are aware of, we just chose not to correct it. But yes, you're right that if in the past when we haven't had it, if there was a claim, League of Minnesota Cities would look into it and say, well, the city isn't at fault because they weren't negligent, therefore it's the homeowner's responsibility. Absent a policy like this that would, you know, where they go out and allow us or investigate it and then pay it themselves. Of course, we and Reem were essentially paying it for them but otherwise we'd have no option. And it's been the desire of past councils to have that as an option for our residents. That's where kicker. So I think what Brad's saying though, is that if, if we lowered the deductible, so if we were, you know, if you had a lower deductible, is that what you're getting at? I mean, with a $50,000 deductible, we're always gonna pay for it, but that $50,000 allows us a very small premium which is why we do it, I'm, I'm assuming. I mean, if we drop that down to 25 or, or 1,000, um, the premium would be so much higher that even with the 11,000 that we paid out of pocket plus the 16,000 in premium, that was 27,000, I'm assuming if you had a $1,000 deductible, the premium would probably be 35,000 or 40,000. So just by definition of that, we, we save money by having a high deductible. I mean, like Sharon says, essentially what we're doing is self-insuring. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's it's just buying less insurance, but it creates the mechanism to allow us to do what we need to do. The hand. Does that answer your, does that, are we, are we getting close? <laughs> I guess you're getting close. I guess my biggest question is, even if we didn't buy this coverage, we could still reimburse our homeowners in the yeah. event. Well, yeah, no, what saying, why? We Legally, can't. we can't? We, we don't have a mechanism to pay them. Legally, we don't have a reason to pay them, and we just can't pay. But we are paying them today, even though we have insurance. We're paying out of our pocket anyway. But we've provided the insurance, which allows us to then compensate okay. with a large deductible. And the other paying. question is, I just how many single instances over 50 grand do we have? And that's I'm sorry, I can't say for sure none, but I'm 99% sure that there were none. I mean, in all these years. I could go back and double, double check. I think what Mr. Brody just mentioned clarifies for me. We have to have the insurance as a mechanism to have any coverage. Because it's a public expenditure. Yeah, right. Okay, okay. For the public yeah. okay. Expenditure. All right. Council Member Demmer? Yeah, this is just, you know. This was one of the first big shocks I had when the council wrote that, that it's this ridiculous situation where we pay the lowest premium we possibly can to get the highest deductible we possibly can so that we have the right to pay people when their sewer backs up. So that it's basically we, we, the only way to self-insure is to buy the cheapest insurance we can. And I don't know if anyone's ever looked into whether we can do this by ordinance so we don't have to do it. Mm -hmm. But right now we're stuck paying the we're stuck paying the insurance company the right to pay people out of our pockets. Yeah, pretty much. And, and there's no way around it currently. But but the but the insurance company is still doing the investigation on yes. this though. Exactly. So we're so getting some a value service. there. Yeah. Okay. That's right. It's just hard to wrap your head around yes. for a couple of years. <laughs> uh, Mayor and Council, I will say that there is a lot of investigation that go into some of these claims, so it's not an automatic. 
Um, the other thing I do want to point out so it's just clear is the city's insurance will only pay up to 10000 per claim and they'll only pay what's unpaid by the homeowner's own insurance. So we still do recommend that homeowners add this insurance to their policy, which, you know, it's possible that there could be a big claim and then they would be covered. Um, if it was, if they were relying on us, there is only a $10,000 coverage. So um, we still, you know, ultimately it would be best if everybody had that coverage on their homeowners. All right. That's for Wells. Uh, it's probably here, here and there, but I, I specifically remember that the woman that came here claimed her damages in excess of fifty thousand dollars. It was like sixty-five or something. I, 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 was, was I remember seventy, but yeah, yeah and because I thought that was a ridiculous amount, but you know that's what she said. I'll, I'll look, and I'll let you know. Any other discussion? We have a motion on the, yeah, we had a motion, but Demer, we had a second. second. All right. All right. Yeah, hearing on no other discussion, we'll, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? And that motion carries. Surprisingly, that was a lot less conversation than we had a couple of years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> Item uh, 13 is to consider resolution 18-23, calling for a public hearing to vacate public roadway easement. And this just looks like lots of cleaning up down there in Port River Walk. Uh, Mr. Brody, or who wants to? That's correct, uh, Mayor and Council members. This is just kind of one of the steps in, in, in preparing the Port River Walk area uh, for the potential uh, Centra development that's going to go in down there. So this is the next uh, item on the uh, um, agenda are just asking us to call for public hearings to vacate two specific roadways within that project. There are other title issues that are being cleared up. I think there's a couple of matters going to Planning Commission this Thursday, again, all in anticipation of, uh, of uh, the development down there at, at that site. Okay. But we still need a motion to adopt the resolution calling for the public hearing, though, right? We do. Councilmember Member Demmer? Um, just so if people want to attend the public hearing, they understand what these roads are. The, the first one, there isn't actually a road there. No. It's an empty lot that has a dry, you know, like an apron that doesn't have a road. The second one is just the 100th Avenue between Crane Street and Bluebird Street, and there's nothing on that block. So that's probably not going to be a hotly contested public hearing, but in case anyone wanted to know. Thank you for pointing that out. That is correct. Um, and then I'm happy to make the motion to adopt resolution 18 dash, am I on the right one? Yep, 23. 23, oh, yep. okay, 23, yep. calling for a public hearing to vacate public roadway easement. Second. Motion by Demmer, second by Geisler. Uh, adopt resolution 18-23, which calls for a public hearing on February 20th, 2018, for a vacation of a public roadway easement. Uh, discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? And that motion carries. And then it's basically the same thing on item 14. Your Honor. Member Demmer. Got out of order because they're actually out of order. Um, I'll uh, move to adopt <laughs> resolution 18-22, which calls for a public hearing on February 20th, 2018, for a vacation of a public roadway easement. Second. Motion by Demmer, second by Kicker. Discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? And that motion carries. Next item on our agenda is to consider resolution 18-28, um, <clears throat> establishing Bunker Hills golf course fees and charges. And uh, are we gonna turn this over to Mr. Anderson? Or? Mr. Anderson, good evening. Mayor, Council, thank you. Um, uh, before you is the recommended rates for 2018 for Bunker Hills. Uh, the vast majority of these rates we recommend staying the same. We believe we're very well placed in the market um, and we look at a metro-wide view um, and pride ourselves on being a, a regional destination for golf. So we look at the, at the full metro. There are some increases recommended. The first one that I'd highlight is to our memberships, our patron cards. And to give you a perspective, we sell about 2,000 patron cards between seniors, couples, and adults. This is a substantial amount of people who commit 
um, to these discount, essentially what becomes a discount card. And we haven't raised these fees for, boy, 10 years or so, I would, if my recollection serves. Um, so slight increases for those. The second increase area is for the driving range. Bunker Hills has become, over the course of the past four or five years, a true practice destination regionally. Um, and we were priced at a very competitive rate, and we believe that uh, moving those rates up um, will still be very competitive with the marketplace, and, and we'll see success there. To put that into perspective, Mr. Anderson, we're talking a $1 increase Thank you. on range balls on the small, medium, and large. Correct. It's right. a $1 increase per bucket size. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, the, the final one that I would uh, that I would like to highlight is the addition of a full place senior membership. Um, as stated before, we sell about 2,000 patron cards. About half of those now are seniors, and that we define that as uh, those aged 62 years or older. We've never had a senior full play membership. At least we haven't since 1987. This allows us to do that and really um, offer those folks, those loyal users of the facility. Uh, an extra opportunity to uh, purchase a full play membership. So, and we've, we're very well positioned with that price point at $1,250 $1, as well. So those are the, the main increases. There are some minor increases to some other memberships um, and range memberships as well, but uh, that is pretty much the, the extent of the recommended increases. And if these are approved, we would begin selling patron cards in a couple weeks on February 1st. So Mr. Anderson, and I'm and I should understand this, but the season tickets, and you just touched on it, must have held a season pass since 1987 to purchase a season pass in 2017. So you're talking people that have yeah. literally bought a season pass every year since 1987. Yeah, and I was just looking at some historical documentation of that. And back in those years, there were so many folks who wanted those memberships, they were capped, um, and they were utilizing the entire golf course at certain times. So the decision was made in 1987 to, to grandfather those folks in and not sell those anymore at that rate. Um, memberships weren't reintroduced again until I believe it was 2011 and a new rate. So those folks years. who have those season passes have held them in some capacity since 2000, or 1987 every single year. I was going to say, I was looking at that too and I was trying to figure out if everybody would be in the senior citizen class. <laughs> <laughs> and it's got to be getting close. They, they pretty much are. Right. Yep. And there's very few. There's, there's less than 20 total in that entire user group season pass. Um, how are we doing on our, uh, um, how are we doing on our uh, um, bunkers? Bunkers. Thank you. Yeah. Well, we're doing really good. You know, we got a little bit of work done in November out there. All 33 bunkers were touched in some form or fashion. A lot of dirt work was done, so we're, we're ahead of the game, which is really nice. Uh, early melt will help us, um, but we're well positioned to get that project done earlier than anticipated and, and be green and ready to go right away. So, This is a big year for bunker, isn't it? It's a very exciting year. On July 8th, it's our 50th anniversary. It's, it's the golf course's 50th anniversary, so more will... We'll be talking about, about that quite a bit in the coming months and, and doing a lot of planning around um, some events and some announcements, and it's going to be a lot of fun for sure. Yeah. Excellent. All right. Council, what are your wishes here? Mr. Mayor, I'll make a motion to adopt Resolution 18-28, establishing Bunker Hills golf course fees and charges. Second. Motion by Geiser, second by Wells. Discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? And that motion carries. Uh, we are on to open mic public comment. I guess we're beyond that now. We don't have any reports on previous open mics. And we're up to other business. Your Honor. Councilmember Wells. As long as we have Mr. Anderson here, uh, what was the heating problem at the, up there uh, about a week ago? You know, in our in our banquet bay, you know, the, you know, rooftop unit had some issues and, and still needs some parts, and and that that kind of led to some other issues, and it's being addressed this week, thankfully, so we can get that back online and, and working properly. But we had that long stretch of cold weather, and it just uh, it wreaks havoc on that stuff, and, and we're looking after it. So, 
by the grace of God, that water, that uh, sprinkler went after the wedding reception was out of there, I heard. Yeah, exactly <laughs> right. Timing is everything. Whew. It's like rain on your wedding day. Oh, boy. Yeah. All right. um, so our next council meeting will be February, what, 4th or something? 7th. 7th. Okay. So that'll be like halfway through snowflake days. One of them. I mean, do we have any snowflake days calendar coming up? Do we know? I know the Miss Coon Rapids pageant is January 27th. It's the only thing I know for sure. Mayor Council, on the city's website, uh, on the front page, there is uh, a link to information on Snowflake Days, including a full list of events and uh, the calendar for uh, those two weeks. Okay. Very good. Other business? Really? Thanks. Nothing? <laughs> All right. Move to adjourn. Second. <laughs> we have a motion and a second to adjourn. I suppose. I suppose instead of saying I, we should say Skull Vikings. <laughs> <laughs> all, in, all in favor of adjourning, say aye. 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 aye.